one. This is the Community and Economic Development Committee, April 22. Uh, can you do the roll call, Mandy? Yes. Mr. Weddleton? Here. Ms. Kennedy? <coughs> Mr. Peterson? Present. Mr. Constant? Here. Mr. Dunbar? Ms. Zalatel? Here. And then for non-committee members, Mr. Rivera? Mr. Perez Verdia? Ms. Allard? Here. Ms. LaFrance? Chair, you have a quorum. All right, thank you. And uh, Mr. Dunbar said he will be coming, but he'll be a little bit late. And Ms. Kennedy is out of town and uh, may be able to make it. She's not certain. <coughs> Excuse me. And I wonder if, how many, how many guests do we have? It's been pointed out it would be kind to the public if we mentioned other people on the list. And I just wonder, Mandy, could you, can you just kind of go down the list of administration folks and all that are here? I sure. don't think everyone should chime in on their own, just so it's on the record. Sure. Or is it already on the record when you record this? It is not. Um, the invitees don't show up, so we can go through and do that. Okay, please do. Um, so we have the two interpreters, Jamie and Gina, and then um, other municipal staff. Um, let's see. I have Ryan Yell with the planning. Um, I guess I don't know all of the staff, so I can just go down the list. So um, Jenna Weltson is attending, Jack Frost, Kent Colhase, Nicole Lebo, Gregory Soule, and then I have two phone numbers, um, one ending in 0522 and one ending in 9449 that are public. So um, if they would like to introduce themselves, you can unmute yourself by hitting star six and just let us know for the record who you are. Eugene Carl Haberman. Okay. Welcome, Eugene. And Louis and Briani. Welcome, Louis. Okay, uh, thank you, Mandy. And uh, okay, so we, uh, the agenda today is uh, we have an initial item, which is a proposed ordinance regarding roll curbs. We call them in our code, but they have different, I think, type one, type two, or often we refer to them as rolled or vertical curbs for those who speak more colloquially about it. Um, and those are things that I, I had actually worked along with Mr. Dunbar and the home builders on, and we have a draft that was sent around, but it didn't get to staff uh, in a very timely way. I just sent it to um, Chris Schutte yesterday. And it's something he's aware is an issue and they've been working with the home builders on. I, I just wonder, is is there someone from the administration here to address, address this? And, uh, Mr. Chair, Kent Colhase for PM&E. I, I don't think at this point there is. It doesn't appear that Mr. Schutte is on and um, not to speak for him, but I think our, our suggestion right now would be to um, perhaps um, postpone this to the next meeting when the, the right folks in the administration are on and able to speak to this. Uh, yeah, I think that's reasonable. I, I would like to uh, just maybe hear from Dean at any rate on just how, what, what is the process when something with title 21 is introduced at the assembly and then you know we should send it to the planning commission and and maybe let it go at that and then we'll take put the discussion of the meat of it off to the next meeting is that okay with the committee i i would briefly like to talk about it as well okay today okay um can we start with dean then dean what what is the process on you know, introducing this assembly, then what do we do to send it to the Planning Commission? Oh, and for the record, uh, Crystal Kennedy is here. Oh, yes, hello. 
Oh, uh, yeah, I actually raised my hand when I saw that question. I didn't realize it was already directed to me. Um, I would believe that when you introduced that you uh, maybe set a public hearing for three months out and just uh, state we're referring this to the Planning Commission. Um, you could do that by motion, uh, referring to the Planning Zoning Commission for their consideration pursuant to code. So code does have a process and I think the Planning Zoning Commission has 60 days uh, to send uh, back to the Assembly their um, recommendation about the ordinance. Um, I could check that if you give me a second. I, I can take it in chat if you would like. Uh, yeah, that'd be fine, I think. OK, so we have a clear process and code then. That seems pretty simple. OK, and we can wait. Um, Chris, you had a comment? Yeah, John, um, <clears throat> I was reading through the materials and um, I had a couple of questions and the questions may again be right for when we have Michelle on the phone, um, but I just wanted to put out my concerns. Um, but my concerns may be allayed by the definition, and so I'm looking for the handout now because I got a stack of emails since it went out. Um, it's the the discussion about class A and new. Um, I, I have grave concerns about the use of the rollover curb. Um, my experience in my district is of the deleterious nature that you mentioned in the memo. People park on the sidewalks. People use them as their own property, and then people can't use the public right of way that's between the property and the street. And so, but that may not matter much depending on that definition of class A, whatever that means, and new. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I just would like to briefly enter that conversation, even though we don't have the experts with us yet. Um, and I want to hear what what that means to you, that class A and new. Okay, well, class A is defined in code and is generally the urban parts. Class B is large lot hillside kind of areas, just broadly. Mm -hmm. So that would be any, your entire district would be class A. So any kind of redevelopment that would happen in my district would then be subject to this policy. Right. And then when you say new, like new subdivision. Well, it does say that there, but I mean, is redevelopment classified as new because there won't be any new subdivisions in my district per se, unless you talk about like what they did at Lusac Manor. That was new. They kind of demolished it and started over. Yeah, that's a good question. OK, so therein lies the range of my concerns. I'm happy to defer the conversation so we have our experts, but I'm str I have strong feelings about this and so does my district that has for decades been begging for the city to come up with uh, the the banked curb instead of the roll curb because of the abuse that we experience from it. I mean, you can't even get code enforcement to remove a vehicle that's parked over the right of way on a roll curb because they say there's nothing we can do. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are legit issues on this, no question. So are you okay with postponing? Yeah, to absolutely, I just want on the record. Yeah, that's, that's good, thank you. OK, well, let's go ahead and um, put this on for the next meeting. And uh, Kent, thanks for that. And um, Mandy, make sure we don't miss that. <laughs> so thanks. OK, well, John, next we're moving. Uh, yeah, we move on. I popped myself in the queue. I wanted to raise two oh, issues. Sorry. Thanks. Oh, well, uh, better. One, I wanted to echo um, Chris's issue, particularly down in Abbott Loop that has come up um, repeatedly, the roll curb and it just being ignored. Second, I'd like to know how the roll curb intersects um, with pedestrian and non-motorized safety um, and Vision Zero. So that'll be one of my uh, questions and concerns moving forward. So um, I just wanted to flag it. Okay, uh, you know, did you put yourself in the queue, Meg? I did. I'm looking here, I'm doing this on my phone. I don't see it, I'm in. Queue please at 9.38 a.m. Oh, there you go, I'm sorry. Okay, I missed Before it, I'll try to watch better. Okay, so I, I, I want to add on Jack's behalf, he says for the record, if the vehicle is parked over a roll curb, it's APD's responsibility. And so, um, yeah, we have those community service officers who do get around. But again, you get properties that have, I, I can think of three of them right now, massive piles of vehicles stacked up, and it's basically a, an urban junkyard, and they do encroach right across that public right away. And there's, I've, I found no solution to that problem. 
Yeah, okay. Well, this will be a good discussion. I look forward to it. So, okay, so are we um, ready to move on then? Here we know opposition. Let's go back to our uh, long project, but I believe uh, we are very close to finishing. And that is proposed changes to uh, Title 10.80 and Title 21 regarding marijuana. And we finished, we were on the, we, we ended on page 29 of the uh, Title 10, which is the lengthier document. And we had just ended up talking about outdoor production, this proposed section. And I'm not sure that we came up, we had a good discussion, but I don't know that we had any advice on this. Did the committee we had talked about, this is regarding allowing um, a greenhouse or outdoor growing. Did, were we, did we have a consensus on this to leave it in? Take it out. And Mr. Chair, uh, for my part, the memory is that um, it doesn't really matter because it's very unlikely that uh, mm -hmm. urban outdoor grows are going to happen. But then there was some um, suggestion mm -hmm. from the representative of the industry that uh, there could be a way to do it in greenhouses. And so I think we should probably keep it in until we have settled on the question of greenhouses. Okay. Yeah, we had a comment from Ryan Yell that said that right now greenhouse is allowed if it's, you know, depending on the zoning, but if it's rigid permanent structure and this is for non rigid. And so you're okay with leaving this in for now? Yeah, just recognizing that it seems very unlikely that this will be feasible within the municipality, but we've seen industries be smart before. And so let's, in my opinion, leave room for them to come up with a proposal that might work. And then we'll take it out if it doesn't make sense. Okay, any other comments from the committee on this? Should we move on or? Meg, Pete, Jamie? Well, Mr. Chairman, this is Pete. It, it does seem to me like it's very unlikely that someone would be growing outside here in the city uh, because of security and also because of trying to control the smell would seem to be impossible. But, uh, you know, I, I guess somebody could come up with a, you know, uh, uh, a new method or something. I guess you never know. Um, we can leave it in now and I, I doubt if it's used but I guess it doesn't hurt anything leaving it in there. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Yell. Yes, thank you Mr. Chair. Um, uh, so I had sent some possible uh, language revisions to uh, Dean uh, just yesterday so um, that was a little late on my part, and uh, that's probably why it's not before you right now. But just trying to clean up this language so that it communicates better with Title 21 and that we're not uh, building in conflicts between the two titles. Um, one other thing that sort of came to light is Title 21 requires marijuana facilities to be within a permanent structure. And one thing that's a little gray to us right now that we may not have a definitive answer on is whether or not open air cultivation would be allowed uh, due to that requirement. So it may need to be a Title 21 text amendment uh, as well to allow for open air cultivation. So that's all. Thank you. OK, so Dean, you let me look. Um, reading in the chat here just to keep up, uh, Mr. Gates added that for sending an ordinance to the Planning and Zoning Commission for review, it can be referred by either this committee or the assembly by motion. Planning commission sets a public hearing. 60 day clock starts after the public hearing for the planning and zoning commission to send a recommendation to the assembly. And Ryan's um, wording, Let, let's go ahead and look at that, Dean, thanks. And Chris, did you want to comment? Yeah, the, the question of the permanent structure issue, I think we have to be really, really careful with that. Um, 
it, it also uh, reflects on the retail side of the business and uh, we have had some applicants wanting to use essentially trailers like coffee carts to do retail marijuana sales and I would have strong concerns about that um, just because basically the structures are viable and it's pretty hard to secure when you have a tin wall and so um, I want to make sure we're looking real closely at questions of opening up temporary structures but if we do that I think that planning zoning may be able to come up with a workaround for security in relationship to uh, cultivation because it, it might be somewhat different thank you all right thanks so let's look oh sorry okay Dean um, has put on the screen the recommended wording from Mr. Yell. Do you want to uh, discuss it, Dean? Oh, if I could clarify. And I don't know if the green highlighting makes it hard to read. I can uh, change the color right now if that's easier for folks. Um, but basically, the highlighted green is Mr. Yao's language, and I suggested to him adding a couple words that I highlighted in yellow here. And uh, because this is paragraph one, is basically an exception to what B says, uh, because the zoning certificate of zoning compliance in accordance with Title 21 prohibits, I mean, it requires all marijuana establishments to be in a permanent structure. So, you know, outdoor production is an exception then. Um, so I want to call it out as what it is, an exception here. Um, and then at least six feet high, this is language from state regulation. And I was just concerned if we left out that um, height dimension for the um, side of screen, wall or fence, that uh, it could be interpreted as we're being less restrictive than the state, and we're not allowed to do that. We can be more restrictive. So um, I just wanted to leave in the six feet height, although I can't imagine that uh, anything less than that would be approved as really being sight obscuring. I mean, I'm five foot nine, but you know, if I stand on my, my laptop, I can see over that. <laughs> um, so. That's the rest of the language below that you see is just from our discussion last week. But uh, I think that Mr. Yali you had a good point. We all already have your current code that sort of uh, complements that section and would be read in conjunction with that outdoor growth. Is, uh, you know, regardless indoors, outdoors, that it can't be observed by the public from outside the facility. So, you know, that side of screwing barrier physical barriers got to be pretty secure uh from observation even and then uh it also does not emit an order detectable so if it's an outdoor grove of some sort um we still have the odor restriction here so they would have to figure that out um so that's the proposed language okay uh chris for you on the you yeah. for this? Yeah, just brief, um, you know, just as a bit of trivia, um, if you have ever seen such a outdoor farm in the right conditions, these plants can grow up to 20 feet tall, taller than trees nearby them. OK, R Ryan, what what is a maximum fence height in any of our zones? Uh, sure. So through the chair, it'd be eight feet. Uh, anything That's a maximum. Eight, correct. Eight feet is the the maximum. If you uh, wanted to go over that, you'd have to apply for a variance um, that would go before the Urban Design Commission. What's uh, or the actually, um? I, uh, I misspoke there. If it were a marijuana uh, standard you know say a fence concealing in an open air could exceed eight feet then uh, that variance would be a marijuana variance to be delegated to the assembly okay do we know what um 
how high a fence needs to be to keep moose out? Uh, through through the chair, I I just guessing on this, um, but I would I would assume probably a five foot, maybe six foot. Um, I, I've seen moose jump, you know, four foot fence or basically walk right over it. So um, I would say probably a minimum five or six feet. Mr. Chair, I just want to note the comedy of what you just suggested and the fact that we had Buzzwinkle once before. This might be. <laughs> Yeah, that would be my worry. They sure seem to get over every fence I put up. OK, so what's the sense of the body then? Should we move forward with the uh, proposed wording that Dean's put <laughs> up here? <laughs> Mr. Chair, again, I would reiterate that it's wise, I think, to leave it, include it, and then uh, okay. we can test the reality of it down the road. Same. OK, well, Maggie, on that, OK, Pete? I agree. OK, all right, let's move on. That's good. Th thanks, uh, Ryan and Dean, for that. See what happens with it. OK, so you want to continue down, Dean? Sure. Um, so yeah, we stopped here on April 8th and uh, let's see. Next, we have um, 1080, 435, and just a reminder, so uh, Article 4, of Chapter 1080 here is all related to uh, marijuana cultivation facilities. So uh, this is just specific to the cultivation operation. Um, some of these maybe seem a little uh, repetitive of what we'll see in the general rules uh, chapter or, or Article um, 7, which we will see a little later. Uh, Anyway, so here, this is about the marijuana inventory tracking system, and this just tracks the change to the state regulation language. So, uh, as you know, they need to transfer packaging regularly to, to, to the retailers, production um, facilities, and testing facilities. So, this is a regular thing for them. You know, we've got a weight restriction of 10 pounds instead of 5 pounds. So, um, that's that's being changed and again just state regulation change. Uh, we have here a little change for clones or cuttings for a batch. Uh, and in the past it was uh, it was just described a little bit differently, the clones or cuttings in terms of plants identified. I think this sort of matches the reality of what they faced. Okay. Any Thoughts on that from the committee? OK, I don't see anything. Let's uh, go continue, Dean. Uh, you're continuing to just in the section about uh, the tracking and recording each each. Uh, we'll have a document for the tracking system. Uh, each sale and transport plants, seeds, package, so forth. Uh, they get a little straightforward and nothing for us to worry about. Um, and here, uh, just repeating this section, I generally think that uh, it was just redundant of what's already kind of apparent and really other parts of of code with regulation. So you don't need to state it again here and that producing marijuana concentrates prohibited. That's only allowed by marijuana production facilities. And you have to get a that marijuana production facility license for that. So um, no need to state it here for the cultivation facility. So I think that's just more of some cleanup. OK, uh, that sink is good. And then. Sure, hope so. So here are about samples that in your subsection. Um, and this was just to allow, um, I guess, what they saw as the uh, restrictions being overly restrictive and not allowing certain sort of uh, ordinary actions that are part of the business. So 
providing sample uh, from the cultivation facility uh, to an employee session who has their hand a little card for the purpose of only quality control. If it's um, oh, they have a, a weight limit and volume limit and uh, registering the sample as well and tracking it. Can no consumption there, of course. I mean, they're not supposed to do that anyways. So that's obvious. Yeah, uh, it's not sold. I mean, that's not what the samples are for. Um, no employee receives. OK, you could uh, pause oh, for a moment. Uh, Chris, you had a comment? Sure. No, previous. OK, um, you know, if I, uh, Crystal, are you on? I am, yes. OK, so I'm watching the chat. Are you able to get onto the chat if you want to get in the queue? Yeah. Uh -huh. OK, Thanks. I'll make sure. Sorry, I just feel like I was ignoring you. OK, um, continue, Dean. Sure. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, they got to complete a form, you know, for the each sample. Uh, maintain copies, need the document, the samples that they're sending out and uh, therefore and so forth. And uh, they've got to package them appropriately for uh, labeling it with quality control. Uh, so they're really cracking down and tracking samples here generally. Um, the samples got to be tested, you know, by a testing facility here. So uh, I think this is all just tracking what the state regulation change is doing is for uh, in terms of improving their um, product sample transport testing. Oh, I'm sorry, my battery's going to go. Give me a second. Okay, thanks. So, so Dean, just to make clear, so these changes are all to reflect changes in the state statutes. Is that correct? Or AMCO. Yes, that's my understanding. And of course, Mandy, jump in if I misstate anything there. <laughs> yeah, no, that's correct. This is on. That's correct. Okay. Uh, I see no comments or questions on that. Go ahead, Dean. Thank you. Um, so. So now uh, we're in a different article for the product manufacturing facility and changes to this article. Um, these are privileges. Uh, and this is just tracking, I think, a uh, state rig change. Again, um, this just allows that vertical integration of the business uh, along with the cultivation facility, health facility, um, or both. So it just sort of uh, makes it abundantly clear that all these licenses are distinct from each other, but you can have these licenses and co-locate. Uh, they just need to be in separate areas. Um, so we saw this with the earlier article for cultivation facilities. Um, so again, just in a room separate from any other operation. And you know, if Ms. Watson is pleased with this, I'm not sure, but she may know more about this. Uh, than anybody else, uh, because I understand uh, the industries advocated for recognizing uh, the vertical integration of these businesses as uh, something just inherently uh, obvious or an inherent trait of the whole industry. So, All right. Oh, uh, see. And then moving on, the handler permit and food safety worker training. Um, we kind of went through this a little bit with the cultivation facility, and I think we changed some language up there. So, you know, pardon me, I didn't change it here yet. Let me make a little note and make sure that I uh, make edits to match. Call correctly. Okay, so we probably don't need to go through that again, right? 
Right, that's good. Thank you. And uh, next is the article on the marijuana testing facilities. So we didn't have much change to production facilities. I guess to, just in a general comment, uh, we saw that the state has a lot more recognition of the production facilities that uh, when we initially enacted this whole uh, marijuana regulation at our local level didn't see the need to duplicate. You know, for example, listing every single product that they will have in their application and so forth. And if they want to add or remove products needed to submit for that, and uh, we avoided that kind of oversight at our level. Um, see, so the marijuana testing facilities. Uh, this one here um, sort of is the uh, count the opposite of what we saw for, for vertically integrating the other establishments. You can't do that with the marijuana testing facility. So uh, can't, may not have this overlapping premises with anything else. So no, we can't share offices and stuff like that. So I can't imagine though that they would be even approved for the same parcel property. And that would create a lot of issues, I suppose. So um, the testing facility license, we're adding uh, this part about approving them. So in this section, uh, Again, referring to the state regulation, and uh, I think that this actually though needs to change to simply. Oops, what I mean. And. Um, the yeah, handler permits required for everybody. OK, oh, hold on. Pause uh, for a moment. See if the testing facility you're working at. Sure. Uh, Pete, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I was going to say it, it makes uh, perfect sense that uh, they don't allow a person who has a testing license to uh, be a cultivator or a retailer or a manufacturer uh, because then, you know, if they were to set up in a situation where they could test their own product, uh, you, we could probably see that that might lead to potential conflicts. And so that section makes perfect sense to me. And just, thanks. All right, thanks, Pete. All right, go ahead, uh, Dean. I agree. And, oh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I agree. And I think actually they, they have that prohibition of swear uh, I didn't check, so I think that this is just sort of clarifying what's already um, restricted or prohibited. Um, let's see. So the next part of uh, requiring handler permit by everyone who's um, physically present and premises, and I think we went through some language change here as well. Uh, so I would make a note. Uh, to, to also address this and edit it. It's consistent with our um, changes to uh, filter. Uh, so here we uh, had no change from the regulation, but we had some changes recommended here by our staff for uh, the reporting and verification requirements uh, for the testing facilities. Um, here we had uh, a final reports of a testing facility to be required uh, uh, to, this, to the municipal clerk, but uh, Amanda can maybe talk about that more if she wanted, but I think it's a little, uh, kind of self-explanatory and she's mentioned it before that uh, we there's no reason for the cloak to receive these reports because we don't really do anything with them and it's really the state's oversight it's looked more closely at that and uh their dec and we was involved in these things so uh it's not something that um the cloak or our health department really uh got their teeth into 
Yeah, and through the chair, this is Mandy. Um, this was something I did ask AMCO about, and this is something they track through um, metric. So that's not something we have access to anyways. So they take care of that all through metric. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't probably list it. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Dunbar has joined us and um, Forrest Weir on um, that proposed change, page 34 of uh, the changes, chapter 10. Um, Ms. Kennedy, you had a question? <coughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I need to go back though. Um, and that would be, I can't scroll this myself, but go back to the um, licensing on the um, marijuana testing facility. Uh, it's, I think it's two sections back, right? They won't go back. Nope, nope, too far. <laughs> it's that section B. Um, right, okay, right. That Yes, the one that's all highlighted in there. And then um, I'm just reading that. The assembly will approve a marijuana testing facility license only uh, if it has found them generally in compliance with good laboratory practices. So I'm kind of a little bit at how do you find them in compliance if they haven't been given a license to operate yet? So can we talk a little bit about really what that looks like in terms of um, being able to identify that good laboratory practice uh, criteria that we're going to expect them to meet before they're licensed? Thanks. Um, does that does that make does my um, question make sense? I think so. Well, I can take a little stab at responding. I think that the uh, good laboratory practices are at least what they uh, have reflected in their application. And you know, I'm not a scientist. Sometimes I wish I was, but uh, that they uh, have outlined what they're going to do and how they're going to manage the product and keep any cross contamination from leaving how they're testing a uh, procedures work, what testing they're going to use, how they're going to make sure that everything's sanitized and sterile, things like that. Um, so if what they've described in their procedures and the application are good laboratory practices, and like you said, you know, they can't maybe look at the history of it, they can look at what's in the application. But uh, I do welcome anybody else um, with expertise on this to chime in. Uh, was so Mr. Hickman here? Is... Uh, maybe someone through from the, the health department. Through the chair, um, Jack Frost is on and um, okay. Code enforcement, land use enforcement goes in and does inspections to match the operating plan that the assembly approved to make sure everything on site matches. So he may want to jump in and say something, but I agree with Dean that, you know, everything that they list in their operating plan is what you're approving to make sure it matches what's required of um, city and state code. But then the inspections verify that so that's kind of the checks and balances okay jack did you have any comments on that no i don't thank you okay uh mr chairman this is pete yeah pete go ahead thank you this language almost sounds like they're talking about renewing a license you know you renew the license if you found that they have been in generally compliance with good laboratory practices um, so, I mean, I, I'm not sure exactly how, how you change that, but it, just reading through it a couple of times, it seemed like they're talking about a, approving a renewal of a license, maybe. I don't know. Just, just a thought. Thanks. Well, John. Um, uh, well, go ahead, Crystal. I'll look at this a little more, but it seems to me that we, it, it really is more of a, a definitions kind of an issue or the terminology, because obviously we're, we're going to be verifying that they have the proper plan in place. We really don't have anything to say that they've had good practices yet. So maybe uh, we can just um, tweak that a bit, um, uh, but I'll look at it a little bit further um, and maybe come up, have some language next time. Thanks. Okay, so Crystal, if we finish and we say, okay, with the changes we've 
recommended in the committee over the last couple of months moves this forward as a ordinance for introduction? Is it something that you could just do as a um, amendment at that point, or would you want to wait, leave it in the committee for a while? Well, I, I can work on it as an amendment too. I, it doesn't matter. It's I don't think it's a big deal because, like I said, I think it's just trying to be able to specify that we're going to look at the plans they have in place for those good laboratory practices. We're not going to depend on whether or not they've had good laboratory practices in the past because it does say, you know, fines to be, which sounds to me like you're going to be looking at how they've operated in the past rather than looking at the fact that uh, they have the proper procedures in a manual or some kind of uh, policy uh, manual. So anyway, um, I'm happy with with just dealing it as an amendment so i can do that thanks okay and actually looking at the clock we've got about we're till 10 oh. 30 or 11. over oh, till 11. oh we're gonna make good progress um okay so dean we're on uh this 1080 670 reporting and verification and, and a question on this do we even need this section in our code because all of it it just seems like it's all really just about what the state would do none of these reports would come to us I'm sorry, did you say 1080? Oh, um, 670. Oh, 670. Jumping us back where we were. Oh, well, right. This is um, 670. Yeah, this is uh, instead of having the reports go to the clerk, you know, by our code to say they've got to have been submitting them to the state or otherwise required by state law. The state decides they're like delegating the duties to some third party or contractor or something like that, you know, whatever the state says. And so the, that uh, Mandy isn't receiving these reports that she doesn't have anything to do with them except put them in a file, you know. So I think that's basically why these changes here. Uh, but if I could go back to, to address just a couple of things on that other section that Ms. Kennedy was talking about. Okay. Uh, the approval. First, Mr. Peterson said maybe it's about renewals, and I would just note that this section is just about the new licenses. So, um, but you know, when you come up for a renewal, the renewal criteria is that they've been in compliance with everything in code that applies to the establishment. So that would still sort of uh, pull in this section by reference. But, uh, but this is really specifically looking at new ones. But then I also wanted to share with you, if I may, what the state regulation says. It's uh, worded a little bit differently. So um, here we've just said generally compliance, good laboratory pra practices, and in compliance with this section, AAC through six, uh, 620. And uh, if I may, let me show you what that says, because that just describes some things just a little bit more and I think that would uh, maybe give Mrs. Kennedy a little bit better. So this is the board, you know, the Marijuana Control Board uh, or their contractor. They've examined the qualifications, procedures, the facility, documented the exclusions, and finds its qualifications and procedures are generally in compliance with. So it's just uh, it describes a little more of the qualifications of the people who do the testing of the lab facility. You know, is it really equipped to do the testing required, the procedures they have? Um, so I don't know. I just thought that that might be a little bit helpful to show that cross reference section here. Uh, that is good. Thank you, Dean. So. Uh, to go back to um, to the document. Okay, there it is. Thank you for uh, indulging me. I said, you said we had plenty of time, so I thought we could jump back. <laughs> uh, so here we have the reports again, um, changed to the clerk, as Mandy mentioned. Um, so you. Well, Dean, on that section. Seven operating. Can we uh, go back on this 1080-670, which just refers to, I mean, on number one, um, it's a report that goes to the their customer, and number two, it's a report that goes to the state. So we're not really involved at all. Do we need this section in there? We delete the whole 1080-670.
that's a good question. You know, when we have our concurrent jurisdiction and uh, dual enforcement, it's really uh, that's a good question. That would mean though um, we don't have an encode, we might have a general violation in section uh, where we could still enforce or have a, a fine as well as a state fine if the state's also pursuing enforcement of a failure to, to comply with this language. Uh, we could take it out. Um, I have crafted and passed some things that simply say uh, the licensee or operator shall comply with, you know, insert state statute or regulation. Uh, and maybe that's all that we can need to do here. Uh, at, by referencing state regulation, it would be submitting the reports to the state and whatever it says there. Um, so, I mean, I guess the answer is yeah, we can delete the whole section. I would feel more comfortable leaving in uh, more of a simple cross reference to the state regulation. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd prefer, I'd, I'd like to keep it simple. I think there's enough of this that the poor industry has to wade through and compare our code to the states and wherever we can make it clear where if you do it for the right for the state you're doing it right for the city and if we can say that in fewer words that would be a benefit okay sorry i'm just going to kind of note that here Might be all we need. Oh, yeah. Um. Okay. Would you like to see that in the next draft? Just what it says uh, in uh, a here. Uh, that looks good to me. I don't see any anyone in the queue, so I guess that works. Any thought? Any thoughts from the committee? Seeing nothing. Okay, let's go ahead and move on, Dean. I mean, change compliance to accordance, but um, sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll mark that up next. Next draft. So Article 7 operating requirements. Um, this is just, I think, some wordsmithing change for better clarity. You know, each agent of an establishment and on each licensee and employee. And uh, we actually, I guess, address similar language through, through previous times. So, um, let me just make a note to uh, perhaps tighten this up a little bit or um, make it consistent with the change that we did for the uh, cultivator uh, facility and the handle of permit. Would that make sense? Yeah, that's good. Thanks, Dean. And then uh, operations, we have this new section 703, uh, operating in accordance with the operating plan by the assembly. Uh, so we, I guess, have this issue come up a couple of times. That this wasn't quite as abundant and clear as it should be. So uh, we have. And then to change things, uh, we've seen operators try to do things differently after they got approved. And here it's saying, well, you did change the operating plan and have it approved by the assembly basically a modification, right? Um, I don't know if Mandy or, or Mr. Yali have uh, more to add about that. Uh, okay, seeing none, um, actually I wanted to check something really quick here. Give me one moment.
Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I was just checking. Yeah, this is uh, consistent with the state reg change. It was added in uh, 2019, so it was more of a clarifying thing. Uh, so license premises alteration. Uh, we have here unlicensed series may now be separate portions of license premises. Uh, and then that refers to 710 and uh, lots of proving overlapping areas. So if we have some common areas, the office, the break room, uh, things like that, when they have some co-located um, vertically integrated licenses, I think this is just further implements that whole concept. OK, just to clarify, Dean, this so comes from the state, is that correct? Yes, just about everything we have here is from the state, except what we noted. Um, Any thoughts from the committee on this? OK, go ahead, Dean. OK, and uh, you know, I was just peeking at the state regulation while you asked, and uh, yeah, this is exactly what the state has done. So, um, And then we have the 712, we have this request uh, from the industry and from some members to uh, recognize breastfeeding. And we actually have in more general state statutes in Title 29 of Alaska statutes that basically prohibits municipalities from you know, prohibiting breastfeeding in a whole bunch of places. So this just sort of specifically recognizes that um, a child up to 18 months of age, you know, can can be on the premises except the restricted areas and then of course you know breastfeeding is permitted in in those other areas so this is up to 12 months here is there what, what's the how long do people breastfeed it's been so long i can't remember depends on the parent yeah <clears throat> Um, yeah, I'm not an expert in that area either. <laughs> uh, I think actually, I'm pulling up the state regulation here. So I'm going to rely instead on, well, are we going to be more restrictive or less restrictive? And state regulation says the exact same here. Bring a child up to 12 minutes of age um, for the purpose of breastfeeding the child. So. Uh, Rather than debate whether we should have a, a higher age, I would say we can go um, be more restricted and can have a younger age or just leave it consistent with the state reg. OK. So, um, yeah, and here we just have um, the inspection is not just going to be for the license, but for overlapping areas as well. Or if they have those common areas uh, for those vertically integrated facilities. And then uh, we have the transportation. And this recognizes the trade show exception. And uh, we'll see that in the uh, section we're coming up to uh, 760. OK. Uh, and here in business records, um, uh, Records can be maintained in overlapping areas. So, you know, you've got a common office, you can maintain all your three vertically integrated licensed businesses in one office, the overlapping area. So, I think that's just a little common sense uh, addition here to the code. So, uh, trade so exception, this has been of much interest ever since this industry launched in, in Alaska. Um, and I think that we've basically just uh, duplicated the state regulation. Um, Andy, did we 
Do you re-modify this a little bit in round? I didn't. I just took it straight over from what the state said. Um, so there might be a few words here and there, but I kind of think it all just um, listed the process and didn't list like the board or anything. So, um, but it might just take a skim through to make sure. <clears throat> so. so this allows, you know, things like the one plan to the show display and uh, bringing up the <coughs> rounds for display um, and it regulates uh, the sample packaging of each product in the uh, not performing tests at the show or event, um, not signing up the show or event, still in sales or all that license premises only. So um, there's no catering license for marijuana events. You know, basically, um, you can handle it, still has to have their handler permit and advertising or promotions after complying with the requirements. You know, that's not changed just because of the trade show. And then we have here the signs and merchandise and advertising. Well, oh, hold on, Dean. And Pause. Sure. Uh, you know, question on the trade shows. What what are, what are the restrictions now? Could, are they allowed to do a trade show at, on municipal property? Oh, um, I actually, for the municipality, we, we have another section that prohibited that. So this is, um, if you have a trade show on, uh, I don't know, let's say, um, I mean, I don't want to call out and name names, but a private um, area like O'Malley Center, uh, Tesoro Center, you know, that's not municipal property, but they can conduct trade shows there. So that wouldn't apply. But I believe that we do have, um, something in our code about uh, not allowing marijuana trade shows in, uh, or at least the product and samples of product being on a municipal property. But I need to double check that. Uh, unless one of our other experts uh, knows off the top of her head. Do we have an expert? I don't, I'm sorry. Mr. Chair, I'm yeah, not Chris, an expert. Go ahead. I'm not an expert, but if we have an arbitrary uh, policy that says trade shows they can't bring their product in, then we need to put that in this for a change. What I thought it was was the specific prohibition before on-site consumption was uh, they weren't allowed to have a place where people could go and consume. Because um, I, I seem to recall the conversation being around should they be allowed to have if it's a private event in one of these places a, a space to go use so i i do want clarification if if we have an arbitrary ban on trade shows within our properties we should put that on the table for editing i uh, yeah dean i'd like to look at that um at, at some point that man I, I recall that there was a trade show outside in tents at the sullivan arena at some point I, maybe um is um Ms. Weltsing there, could she tell us? Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, sounds sounds like Ms. Weltsing. Um, do or can you what what is the status of trade shows on municipal property? Oh gosh, I, I mean, we did have that one outside the Sullivan Arena um with the tents and stuff. In my understanding have a trade show as long as there wasn't any marijuana there um which is different from what the state regulations are marijuana as long as it's entered into metric and there's a now a metric system where you can pull out marijuana packages for showing not selling um and you can pull out plants for showing um not selling and it's it is like a specific trademark transaction not trademark trade show transaction that you can do in metric and then you you do a manifest to the actual facility. So say if there was one at the Sullivan Arena, um, a cultivator which, you know, say, OK, I'm going to take three plants for a trade show, do that transaction in metric, 
do the trip manifest so that it's tracked as it's as it's being delivered as it's being driven to the Sullivan Arena, then they would, you know, participate in the trade show event and then manifest it back to their facility and enter it back into their metric. Okay, have there been, what's the history of trade shows in Anchorage? So there's been trade shows in Anchorage, but there hasn't been, um, absent like the very first one, there was like one before the rules really got into place. It was like in 2015 at the Denina Center. Um, absent that one where there was a couple marijuana plants actually on site, there hasn't been, to my knowledge, allowed marijuana product or, or plants on a municipal property, um, venue. But it is allowed under state law. It's just, you know, the Muni hasn't, hasn't let us use the, their venues to display actual marijuana product. Is, is there a desire to do a trade show at the Denina or Egan or? Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, if you look out, um, you know, Settlers Bay, they just had an event recently um, and, you know, that's out in the borough and so they're in a private property. And so I think that they had marijuana out there for show and display um, and plants. Um, I didn't personally go, but I, I think that that's what happened out there. And I've seen others, you know, in previous years, I've seen other conventions out there that they had those things. Um, so yeah, of course there's a there's a desire for it, but I mean the city really owns all of the venues that would work for this. I mean I guess absent like maybe the Sheraton um, would be able to handle it, and, and maybe Captain Cook. Um, but other than that, there's not that many options. All right, thank you. Any any thoughts on the committee on this? Maybe looking at um, allowing trade shows on municipal property, or at least proposing that. Yeah. Chris? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Um, uh, any, any thoughts on this? I mean, should, I mean, you, I guess you did, you wanted to kind of revisit that bring prohibition. It in. It's arbitrary. And so let's at least have the conversation as we're moving through this process. I just don't know. We're not talking about selling any products. We're talking about just display. And, uh, it just it's super weird. I don't know of any other product line uh, in the world of kind of trade shows up here where we say, well, y you just can't do that here. You know, your business is acceptable, but don't bring it here. It, it actually makes it so our facilities are less viable for commercial use. Okay. The, uh, Pete? Oh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And uh, yeah, you know, they've had, you know, trade shows in other parts of the state before. And, and uh, I, I believe that the industry has shown that uh, they're willing to follow the rules. We just have to decide uh, what rules we, we want to create for these trade shows. And uh, I, I, I think they'll, uh, they'll follow those rules uh, because they actually really want to have uh, conventions or whatever here in in Anchorage, uh, since we are the population center of the state. Um, just so if we if we can figure out a way to do this and feel comfortable with it, uh, I don't have a problem with it. Thanks. All right, thanks, Pete. So, Dean, can you put that on your to do list? Is um, rewording of that prohibition to allow. Um, Trade shows on public property and municipal property. Uh, yes, sure, Mr. Chair. And, uh, I was listening to people and thinking about this. And what I uh, am recalling is that when the uh, legalization first hit the market here locally, uh, was it 2016 or 2017, and they had some trade show planned that. Uh, I think it was a resolution and not part of code, actually, that uh, the assembly passed, uh, probably out of an abundance of caution with this being so new to not allow that on municipal premises, municipal property. Um, so I will find that resolution and actually, and if I don't, then I will tell you that my memory was wrong again. <laughs> um, but I'll bring that to the next meeting and we can revisit the issue. Um, 
you know, it's been four or five years ago, so obviously the industry has grown and matured, and uh, this body can decide, well, it's time to get rid of that, if there was if that resolution, if it's still in effect. Okay, good. Uh, thanks, Dean. So let's go ahead and continue. We're on to signs 1080.770. Uh, yes, and um, here what I would call, uh, I'm sorry, it's been a little while since I looked at this, but what I recall is that uh, we were relocating this, it's similar to the state, they relocated the regulation as well, uh, but it was earlier in our retail establishments article, but you know, the signs apply to all of the establishments, not just retail, so we moved it to the, to the general provisions and um, uh, basically, though, I don't think there, there's a lot of substantive change to it. It's just more clear. Uh, we had some initial issues over signs that uh, Mr. Frost is probably familiar with. Uh, I guess back from the, the first year of this industry here or so, uh, we've had some refinements since then, and this just reflects our latest and greatest sign regulation for marijuana establishments in the general section 770. So, uh. okay, thank you. It's a lot of words for signs. So, Mr. Chairman, this is Pete. Sure, Pete, go ahead. You know, I think I need to revisit this. If, um, so, is, is this all new language that came straight from the state, or um, where exactly did, or is this something new that we're putting in ourselves? Through the chair, this is Mandy. This is uh, all state uh, language. State language. OK, thanks. This uh, section J. Seems and how would how would you enforce this as long as no more than 30 percent of the events participants and audience is reasonably expected to be under 20 years of age? Twenty-one years, John. Twenty-one. I guess, thanks. You know, this maybe not. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to speak over somebody. No, go ahead, Dean. Oh, uh, you know, this is about sponsoring events, not necessarily an industrial trade show. Maybe they want to sponsor Kids Day, but I think that wouldn't qualify because of this restriction here. But you know, suppose they want to sponsor the. Um, I don't know, an Oktoberfest event, uh, you know, where there's alcohol served, no marijuana or stuff, but they just want their logo saying we're sponsoring this too. Uh, so you can expect that most people will be over 21 there. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I see the intent, but the practical sure. point is how do you know 30%? That's a um is a you know i get lots of requests to sponsor things and it never crossed my mind to say well i'll generally ask what the you know kind of expectations and themes are but it'd be hard to know for most of these i mean it's pretty clear um you know i think miss welsing put in a comment this is to restrict marijuana businesses from advertising at a youth soccer tournament um which seems pretty clear but other events would be it's obviously kids day would be probably over 30 percent would arctic comic con you know be over 30 percent or under you know kids that's hard to say so, okay what's well, something to ponder uh let's go ahead dean you know 
And I would like to uh, also mention Miss Watson said it's an incredibly subjective standard. I was thinking the same thing here. You know, I think that uh, there will be events uh, where it's like really so obvious, you know, it's directed towards children or it's directed towards adults. But then we're talking about a 30 percent. And, you know, if if you can't tell, I don't know how you're supposed to determine from an enforcement standpoint, the reasonably expected standard if it's, you know, an event that's just broadly uh, all ages type of event. So I don't really know maybe where they direct the events advertising and stuff, but um, it's I think where you have, you know, sometimes you have small gray areas and, or, and other times you have large gray areas uh, when it's an incredibly subjective standard like this one. Then I think you have a large gray area here, but you have some obvious areas where it's going to be prohibited. And obvious areas where it's allowed. OK, all right, and I've got a note. Um, Ms. Kennedy has signed off. Um, go ahead, Dean. Let's um, I don't see any other. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Pete. Oh, sure. Go, go ahead, Pete. Uh, thanks. And, you know, it mentions a sport event or competition. You know, for example, if you've got a baseball game going on at Mulga Mulgahee Stadium, you know, there might be 30 percent people under the age of 21 that would be going to that ball game. I don't believe that the Alaska League would sell advertising to a marijuana business. But, you know, they, they do have a large uh, segment of the population that consumes alcoholic beverages at those events. So um, not sure how how they would view that. Just wanted to throw that out there. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you, Pete. OK, moving on, Dean. Sure, and uh, I just wanted to say that I have some real reservations about this, but it's come just following state um, state regulation change. But uh, the reason is, you know, we had this other issue about coupons and giving discounts. And this just seems to be going uh, it, I have to get conflicts with some other provisions we have in code and that the state has in the regulations. So I think they have this general idea of sales and promotions. Generally, they put this in, but maybe didn't look closely at some other um, sort of uh, accommodations they had for promotions in other parts of the code or of the regulation. Um, so. Uh, I mean, holding promotional activities outside of the licensed premises. We just talked about trade shows, and that's a whole promotional event. So I'm not really sure what this, why, why this is here, <laughs> you know. So uh, I don't think this section was well thought through, is what I'm saying. But we are just modeling after state regulation. So. It's a good point on four. That Seems to contradict that the trade show. Hmm. I don't think that we have a definition of um, promotional activities. Uh, if that we do, I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> we see here. I, I don't recall seeing a definition for that, but if they, they defined it to exclude some things like trade shows, then this would make some sense if they had a defined term. But I don't recall seeing one, so uh, it will, yeah, uh, just wanted to mention that. So I, uh, it, I actually uh, don't know the value of that sec section K here because some things you see are already um, prohibited, like this is prohibited in other areas. So, I mean, just from my perspective, if you omitted subsection K entirely, I don't think it makes any substantive difference overall. Uh, but it does uh, like eliminate what might be some confusion conflicts. But um, that's just my sort of side thought on that. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind 
deleting that because it seems redundant and this number four seems contradictory. Mandy, can you check is um, can you check with AMCO and see what their thoughts are on, on 4R? Yeah, I can do that. I mean, they may have they must have a definition. Is, um, OK, so any thoughts on the committee? I mean, is that can we delete K? I would support it, the deletion. Mr. Constant here. OK. J Jamie, you know, when I call the committee, you're certainly welcome to chime in as well. And I'm watching the queue if you want to speak on anything. Thanks, John. Sure. OK, well, let's mark that for deletion then, Dean. But I'd still be curious on that seeming contradiction, Mandy, if you could check with AMCO. Yep, I will do that. Thanks. OK, moving on. We're in the home stretch, folks. All right, the home stretch. And I guess I've got uh, 14 minutes left, so we'll do a little speed scrolling. <laughs> uh, let's see, so we've got our related enforcement and penalties. Uh, so we've just accommodated the overlapping premises you know, for inspection. Uh, the right to inspect. Uh, we've also had this season place um, place on hold. We wanted to clarify that here. We had some enforcement actions um, and uh, that some enforcement actions just we're not going to take the plants and product out. We we'll leave it there and seized and put a hold on it. And I think that's what that accommodates. Um, and I think it really was also about uh, holding in place. So we have uh, and so changes to the appeals section. Uh, someone who's aggrieved by final decision for license endorsement or civil fine or upholding, if you're aggrieved by upholding an administrative hold or seizure, they can appeal the Superior Court. Uh, so just uh, expressly acknowledges that you've got some grievance about the hold as well as a license or fine action um, that you can go to Supreme Court right away. Uh, this surrender instruction, there's no change here, uh, but we do have that 10 days that we talked about a few times. I think that's uh, just reflected in the earlier section in Article 1 as well. Um, do we have the public records and general provisions? Uh, so this allows a facility to or establishment to designate materials confidential. We expressly acknowledge the security system configurations. We allowed that to be held. It just reflects our practice. Um, we did that while there were some break-ins and from some local businesses here to help protect them. And so we have next in our definition section of uh, well, we just define state board and marijuana control board for clarity. If it wasn't clear enough, <laughs> uh, we have the definition of batch or harvest batch, and this aligns with what we saw in the tracking and uh, the transportation of certain things, the quantity of bread and flour is part of the batch as well. Um, and you might recall that we had a wait limit time. The, um, transport for sampling of batches. So uh, that means the bottom flower are part of that weight limit when the, uh, the word batch is used. Uh, we have licensed premises, the definition recognizing the overlapping uh, status for those vertically integrated businesses. Uh, we have the total CBD, total THC uh, recognized here. I think that those um, like uh, I don't want to say confusion, but this just clarifies things for testing purposes. Uh, and then we do have the definition of a trade show, which, oh, hey, it's a promotional event, isn't it, by definition? <laughs> so that just sort of extremes my concern <laughs> um, with that subsection K. And so here we've got this, uh, our last section, effective date, um, effective immediately. And I just highlighted that because perhaps the body wants some delay in uh, this being effective for the industry to. Uh, 
adopt to what's coming or we can make it effective immediately and you know let the enforcement process give some reasonable time to come into compliance things like that so uh perhaps you want it to be effective like with the uh licensing uh, cycle September 1st of every year is when new licenses become effective, right? So I don't know. I just highlighted that for the uh, committee's consideration. Yeah, we're on our okay. end. Okay, and that's something we can, we'll hear from the industry on this. We could change the effective date um, fairly easily. You know, through an amendment. Okay, any, well, yeah, yes, thank you, Dean. This has been uh, many months going through this word by word. Um, any comments from, uh, go ahead, Pete. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see uh, Jack Frost has rejoined us, and I'm wondering if we could go back to the fine section. Uh, we were looking at that a couple of weeks ago, uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Frost, I believe, had to leave before we finished that section. And he and I actually had, uh, uh, had an email thread conversing about the fines. And, uh, you know, uh, we've had such a good relationship with the industry uh, in recent uh, months uh, that, you know, we didn't see a reason to increase the fines at this point in time if we were having difficulty getting compliance, then maybe that would be one way to uh, to uh, to improve compliance. But uh, that we, we didn't seem like we've been having problems like that. And so uh, anyway, um, I, that would be something I'd be willing to hear uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Frost's uh, ideas on if, if he'd like to give us his opinion on that. Thank you. Okay, and just before th that, uh, so I, uh, Amanda emailed out the proposed fees again uh, this morning. And Mandy, is that posted on our website? Fees? Yes, it is. Okay, so for public who's listening, there's, if you go to the Community Economic Development Committee website, the proposed fees are posted there, and it's, it's just a starting point that came from code enforcement. So, uh, Jack, yeah, did you want to address these again, or? Mm -hmm. I was talking about fines, actually. I, yes, thank you. Uh, fines, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would. Uh, I think I, I misunderstood the, the context of the initial question. When I, when I, uh, when it was originally posed many months ago, my understanding was it was the will of the assembly that we change the fine schedule. And so our recommendation was if that was the case, then we would align it, uh, recommend aligning it similar to how we've done with the towing industry and make it. Uh, uh, one flat fine across the uh, whole spectrum of potential violations. But uh, I, I concur with uh, what Mr. Peterson has said and what our conversation uh, email thread was, is that we have had uh, amazing cooperation with the industry. The fine schedule as is, is working fine. So uh, I, obviously I defer to the assembly for their for your recommendation, but we don't, uh, code enforcement doesn't see a need for a change at this point. Oh, okay. Um. Chris, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, and I was surprised to see the across the board list, and I thought that the impetus for the conversation about escalating fines or changing of the fine schedule was because of that rare incident when you do have a party that is essentially flouting all the rules. And uh, so I, I am happy with us not pursuing an increase, but I certainly recognize that when you do have a, a, a an operator that just kind of creates an environment where they feel like the rules don't apply to them, which we've experienced only once, um, then we are hamstrung. And so I think that's where this conversation was at. But I, I would concur with Mr. Peterson and Mr. Frost that at this point, people are all in compliance. Thank you. Okay, any other comments from committee? So, you know, I, I'm, I mean, our main thing that we've seen most routinely, Jack, are the odor issues. And I've heard some say, well, it's cheaper just to pay $500 a day, or I guess it doesn't generally come out to that, than to fix it. Is that is that true, or do you find that the 
fines or fine. Actually, I'm sorry. Sorry, I don't remember what the order fine is. I I should know offhand, but I don't. Those uh, for for the most part, we haven't had uh, many odor complaints in recent memory. Uh, we had one on on Post Road recently, but that was due to an automobile accident that penetrated the uh, exterior of the structure, releasing the uh, the odor to the out to the exterior. So. Um, we haven't had any any major issues with that, and when we have, the businesses have been responsive. Okay. And again, we all always have the if, if we have a, a violator such as Mr. Uh, Constant referred to, if someone just was was flaunting uh, with willful disobedience, continual uh, continual noncompliance, we always have the uh, the ability to issue a stop work order as well. So there there are tools available. Okay. My understanding was there that a lot of this was, it, there's a complexity here. It's such a long list. Is there some benefit? Is it something that we could um, shrink this list or is this typical for your work and that we're, it's okay? <laughs> we could, uh, we could work together to look at, at shrinking it. No, it's not, it's not typical. This is the only, only, uh, area of enforcement that has such a detailed list that I'm aware of. Yeah, it's a little mind boggling looking at it. I can't imagine your poor code of force people going no. through this list. No, I agree. We could we could uh, we could simplify it and and include um, many of the areas under under certain categories and just reduce it down. We'd be, we'd be happy to work uh, and work on that. Yeah, that I think that would be helpful. I, I um, Uh, Chris, on that, or were you? Or did we already get you? Yeah, no, I already spoke. Okay, are we? Oh gosh, we're almost at the time. Okay, um, could, can we extend? Can someone move to extend the meeting a few minutes so we can get public comments in after move Dean extend. speaks? Move to extend five minutes. Five minutes. Um, okay, we'll do this quick then. Um, any opposition? Okay, and hearing none, we'll go uh, an extra five minutes. Dean, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks. Uh, just briefly, I had a very brief discussion with Mr. Frost. Um, I have some idea to really, uh, address the concerns about the fine schedule being so lengthy and complex. And if we're changing almost, I, I don't know, 90% of them to $500, there's a much better approach to uh, how to outline it in code. Similar to our traffic of uh, our uh, Title Nine for our traffic regulations or traffic code. Uh, we have a section that says, you know, anything in this chapter is fined by five hundred dollars unless stated otherwise in the fine schedule. And fine schedule just address some of those specific areas where we want a very high fine or some sort of graduated schedule, you know, for uh, multiple or repeated offenses like old or things like that. And so I will try to have that in the next draft iteration, working with Mr. Frost on it. OK, yeah, it sounds like there's concurrence on that. That would be good, um, Jack. Yeah, if you can make it simpler for you and the industry, that's a big win for all of us, I think. Um, so I think where we're at is we've gotten through this. We've got the, I think we already did the Title 21 proposed changes. That was just, I think, three. But Ryan said there might be a need for um, another change um, related to the, um, you know, if, allowing outside. So how about for next meeting, if Ryan's still here, bring that proposed change regarding outdoor cultivation. Uh, we'll do the fees and then um, I think, Dean, you had a couple other small things, but, but I think that the things that are out there now are fairly simple. And um, after looking at those few items, go ahead and be prepared to send this forward as a, you know, th through the process. Sounds, sounds uh, good to me, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Let's uh, go ahead to uh, public comment. We've got a, still just two people out there. Mr. Haberman? Um, since you can call Heyman, uh, no comment at this time. Thank you. 
All right, thanks, Eugene. Mr. Imbriani? You can hit star six, unmutes you. Right, Mr. Can you hear me? Okay, sure. All right, um, real quick, this is kind of on a different different topic. Um, for the record, my name is Louis Imbriani. Um, I just wanted to approach this committee in particular about the upcoming um, renewal of contracts, specifically for the Sullivan Arena, Ben Boki Ice Arenas, and the um, Denina and Egan Center. Um, I was wanting or asking if you guys could look at splitting the contract and combining the Egan Denina and Sullivan because they have kind of the same structure when it comes to the way events run where Ben Boki and Dempsey are very much more for the community and are used on a more regular basis um, in that regard. So by splitting or taking Ben Boki and Dempsey out of the Sullivan Arena contract, it would open it up for somebody who might be a little bit more specialized or even the city's parks and rec department to run it so that it can be run a little bit more efficiently for specifically the ice users, not just hockey, but um, to be able to bring in more events like uh, broom ball and more figure skating and something that can be a little bit more community involved rather than it being run by this company outside of the state. Um, that's all that I have. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. That's uh, been uh, a discussion, I think, with the hockey people. And uh, Mr. Schutte's mentioned uh, that they're looking at that, too. And I think there's some extensions to the current contract that may get in the way of that. But I don't know that that's a certainty either. So um, it certainly has validity. So appreciate your bringing that up. Um, anything else from anyone? Hearing nothing, are we adjourned? Move to adjourn. Thank you. All right. See everyone at the next one. Thanks. Bye.